What's great about modern game development is that a tiny team can set out to do a few things really well because no one else is doing it. Nuclear Option by Shockfront Studios is such an example, combining the best features of the flight sim genre and adding tactical nuclear warfare on top. Is it good? Yeah. Even in its very early access state, currently 0.26, the flight mechanics and gameplay gel incredibly with the scenario design absorbing dozens of hours already. It's also coming out from Australia, which already feels like a nuclear hellscape in summer. However, I'm not good at this game. The only non-space flight sims I've played before were Ace Combat, Crimson Skies, and Project Wingman, none of which resemble a real simulation. Titles like DCS and War Thunder seem like a career investment rather than something I can play for a couple hours. I really like Nuclear Option because it fills that middle ground, offering a tougher skill ceiling and realism that's both fun and approachable at an entry price of only $15. Oh yeah, those nukes. It's great playing something that doesn't dick you around through needless grinding or excessive prices for half-baked ideas. What Nuclear Option really resembles is the late 90s catalogue of contemporary and near-futuristic flight titles from Nova Logic and Jane's Combat Simulations. A high amount of action across scripted missions grounded in a semblance of reality and quality of life features you'd otherwise not get in true sims. Unless you're a vet of the genre and have a throttle and hotas ready, it will take time finding the controls that work for you. Fortunately, the devs have enabled various keyboard and controller combinations. There are several tutorials plus a free flight mode so you can practice with all the vehicles. After an hour taking off and crashing using the mouse as a virtual joystick, I settled on using the Xbox's gamepad and it works fine and fully remappable in the options. The keyboard was used for a few commands, such as ejection and moving the map screen. The thumbsticks didn't fully work for some reason. Controlling crafts will be familiar to anyone that's tried Ace Combat or Project Wingman. Taking off is easy as is successfully landing, as long as you have your gear lowered. Speeding up and slowing down is quick and stalling uncommon. You're quite nimble and most crafts can take a fair beating. Tracking enemies is simplified in the close combat range and the cockpit's dashboard shows a camera feed of your targets. The greatest degree of realism comes from the design and functions of each plane. Starting out, Nuclear Option has several vehicles of various complexity, an unlisted difficulty selection of sorts. The Cricket is a light attack plane, easy to control and maintain stealth, with its propeller engine and light armament. You'll use the multi-roll compass jet the majority of time, decent anti-surface and air capabilities, and the widest loadout selection. For air superiority, the Revoker excels in wiping out targets at mark speed and is also the hardest plane to control, as the game simulates G-forces, knocking you out whenever turning too sharply. There's the Dark Reach, the dedicated strategic bomber that carries massive payloads, wiping out ground units and structures, if it doesn't get blown up first. Finally, the Chicane, the helicopter gunship that will wipe out vehicle columns and uniquely features a gunner co-pilot who will fire the 30mm machine gun when in range. Quite helpful, especially when it's shooting this a hundred times faster. All the vehicles are fictional, a combination of different designs of the Tomcat, B2 Spirit, Gripen and Rafale. The Chicane is quite interesting, as it's likely inspired from the Comanche Light Attack Helicopter, an ultimately cancelled project that's best remembered in Nova Logic's Comanche game series. It's a nice nod. They all look great and animate wonderfully due to dozens of individual parts modelled such as the engines, wings, flaps, cockpit, landing gear and propellers that will break apart when under fire. What's nice is that outside of the cockpit being destroyed, you can keep flying even after suffering damage. Never has being gunned down or blown out of the sky look so good or satisfying just scraping by in your busted up gunship. Outside War Thunder, and if you remember the Halo games, there's been little effort to add decent vehicle degradation. It's about time this was rectified. There are also ground based vehicles controlled by the AI, and like the aircrafts, the design seems based on American or German stocks, giving an essential combined arms flavour to the fighting. There's currently no infantry, nor do I think they're needed, they'll be irrelevant to the large scale gameplay. The devs could instead add artillery. A battery of rockets or explosive shells streaming across the screen would look neat. Although the tutorials teach you how to fly, the real difficulty at least for a flight sim novice like me came from the myriad of technical details left somewhat unexplained. The in-game encyclopedia does a nice job showing each unit and weapon and what they're best used for, but for advanced manoeuvring at high speeds, how to avoid radar detections, countermeasures against missiles and the various munition types and subtypes, you're better off reading some of the user guides on Steam. Basically, if you fly under 20 meters and use the terrain for cover, you can avoid most radar detections. Infrared missiles can be neutered by slowing down whilst popping flares, and semi-active radar missiles are avoided when flying low or perpendicular and hitting the radar jammer. 
This is essential knowledge and makes combating anti-air installations and naval combat far easier. Again, this is probably obvious to anyone familiar with the genre. I just would have liked it explained as a casual sim player. In terms of current mission content, there's about a dozen taking place across one giant map. There's no story or characters besides it seemingly being a civil war between two factions. The missions themselves are a mix of conventional air operations. Destroy convoys, bomb supply depots, interception and air superiority. They're all available from the get-go and vary in length and challenge, 5 to 15 minutes. Their quality varies, a couple don't seem to work very well, but they're basically placeholders for a much more developed campaign down the road. The standard however is the escalation mission, or really game mode, as an incredible showcase of nuclear options potential. You pick one of the factions either in the north or south, and then have to fight a full scale war complete with allied ground and air units, capturing or destroying airfields and factories. There's no respawn limits, instead there's a rank progression system that unlocks other aircrafts whose loadouts you're free to customise. Although there's no frontline you might see in other games, the variety of targets and freedom of approach allows nice, dynamic encounters and loads of replayability. You can focus on destroying armoured formations, radar outposts, anti-air batteries, or achieving air superiority, and both sides' AI hold their own. There's plenty of air and ground combat, and it's not long before the roads and hillsides are choked with wreckage and smoke. Although you don't have any wingmen or tactical orders, units can be moved around via the map screen. It feels undercooked. I hope they expand upon it, adding an artillery and missile platforms they could call in, or fill a wingman to cover bombing runs. As the fighting escalates, you'll finally get to use the titular weapons of mass destruction, and they are well worth it. Right now, it's either a 1.5 kiloton semi-guided bomb, or a 20 kiloton cruise missile. For reference, the largest conventional bomb, the Moab, has a yield of 11 tons of TNT, and the first nukes were around 15 to 20 kilotons. You're going to be dropping dozens of these across the map, be it at single enemy units or bases, and the AI is more than happy to return the favour, leading to widespread devastation, minus the huge humanitarian costs. They look amazing. Massive fireballs and shockwaves that'll rip apart anything caught. The best since World in Conflict, from 17 years ago. Fuck. Seeing a depiction of tactical nuclear warfare like this is very rare, instead of the usual end of the world depiction like in DEFCON for example. If you're a true OG, you might have recognised the F-22 Lightning inspirations. Nuking terrorist hideouts to make things... better. Nukes will hopefully be tweaked to have more after effects. EMPs and radiation could lead to interesting playstyles. Why yes, I do mean reenacting that anti-air nuke strike from By Dawn's Early Light. Good movie by the way. There is the problem of being so powerful, other large conventional munitions become redundant. But I suppose that's the point. Your attacks can be easily countered by radars and anti-air units, the SPAG being particularly annoying in shooting your missiles and bombs effortlessly. In the words of another player, winning requires peeling the defences like it's an onion, supporting your own teammates and softening the opposition before delivering the knockout blows. Once you start understanding all the mechanics in earnest, it feels fantastic, even after a dozen times, and it's clearly going to attract a strong multiplayer scene with the escalation mode. There's a few issues and exploits I noticed though. The ranges on radar and cruise missiles are quite generous. They outrange most of the map and hit your targets at near 100% efficiency once cleared of AA. On the other hand, machine guns demand almost pinpoint accuracy to hit anything, made harder by always zooming onto bore sites when in range, despite deselecting it in the options. Turns out, what's happening is that it's resetting your FOV to the default. I wish they just made the hitboxes a bit more generous. It's a strange quirk in an otherwise nicely presented and performing title. The game never crashed and rarely slowed down unless playing on user-made missions, which could be my own system. Besides the play models, the explosions look and sound great, with persistent scorch marks and wreckage of buildings and ground units. You can slow down time and follow each missile and bomb as they glide onto target. Adding a replay feature to better capture your strikes would be neat. Building upon this and better textures, cockpits, modelling and environmental impacts from the fighting like smoke, radiation or electronic damage could make Nuclear Option a benchmark in destructibility. An unexpected pleasant surprise was the original music. Apparently it's all placeholder, except it already fucking slaps hard. Slyly riffing when starting a mission, then kicking in once taking off the first time, or after leveling an airbase. If the soundtrack is only getting better, signing on now is as good a time as any. I would have finished this video weeks earlier if I weren't constantly distracted by playing Nuclear Option when typing up this script. It's just that kind of game. The active community is quick to give advice and upload custom mods and scenarios, currently on the Discord server, but likely soon via Steam Workshop. 
It's still got a long way to go before being a fully featured game, but I have no buyer's remorse and I'm happy to shill for anyone that indulges my nuclear warfare itch. I'm sure this will be a new flight sim cult classic. Now if you made it this far and want to see me cover games like this more frequently, consider supporting me directly. Every little bit helps for the time and effort to make these videos for you, and it's always a pleasure seeing your responses and these games receiving the deserved attention.